I would describe cultural appropriation. All right, I'll take that first paragraph real quick. So what is the distinction between a Black American and first generation Black African? So a Black American is defined as a person, part of the ethnic group of Americans with total or partial ancestry from any of the Black racial groups in America. And then Brandon, you want to take that next one? Yeah. A first generation Black African is defined as a person with parents that were the first to gain citizenship in America or a person that came to America at a very young age. So basically, um, I came at age five, so I'd be first generation. Because basically my whole life is American, is, is in America, so. So why do we make this distinction? In America, if you identify as Black, you are labeled an African American, but Black is not a monolith and many people have cultural identities that are limited under the term African American. For example, there are Afro-Latinx, Afro-Caribbean, biracial people, African people from so many different cultural backgrounds in Africa, and Black Americans. This is not to be divisive or to create binaries of Blackness, um, but not everyone living in America who identifies as Black is an African American. They live in America, but that does not mean that they were born here, that they take part in our cultural norms, that they speak our native language in their homes, that they understand or completely relate to the Black American experience, among so many other things that um, are culturally different from someone whose grandparents and parents were born in the United States. So we'll be now tuning into Black American cultural appropriation. Let's get it. So let's talk about Black American culture. I think a lot of us who are in this panel have either lived part of Black American culture or have seen it and didn't realize that it was Black American culture. So let's just dive into it, right? So Black American culture is, is literally integrated in American history from fashion, music, politics, dance, art, etc. You know, a couple of examples that we could really look at, you know, if we're looking back in history is the Harlem Renaissance era. Um, um, era. We can look at hip hop culture, uh, many internet trends that we tend to see in fashion, in music. I mean, music is a huge indicator. Um, you'll see that a lot of styles like pop, rock and roll, country, originally stemmed from black communities um and you you'll have you know i think like one of my what's not my favorite story because it's total cultural appropriation is the fact that like elvis presley pretty much mimicked black performers and everybody calls him like the king of rock and roll and that's like how are you going to be the king if you just regurgitating something from black culture. So um, it's even in language, um, which we'll dive into a little bit more, which is a BE or African-American vernacular English. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different parts of black American culture that if you were to go to any particular part of American history, we're gonna be involved <laughs> in some shape or form. Um, so we're just gonna touch on a few of the main parts of appropriation that we tend to see, at least in today. Um, so if we can go ahead to the next slide. So a big one is Black American culture and fashion. Um, a lot of times when we think of Black American culture, um, you think of the big hoop earrings that women will wear. Um, styling their baby hairs or having laid edges, um, long, extravagant, like nails that are truly an art form at the end of the day. I wish I could have long nails, but these are $7 press-ons. <laughs> so um, the, the whole idea of the lip liner with lip gloss combo, which a lot of people tend to confuse that with like 
like being a cholo or chola like no that's actually that still is rooted back into black american culture um sneakers with dresses you know the brands that were really popular back in the early 2000s like fubu baby fat sean john you'll see that a lot of those brands like a lot of the bigger name name brands or luxury brands that we know of would take from those particular you know black brands and try to market it as something that's new um a and a recurring theme that you're going to see when it comes to appropriation is really the first stage of that is going to be mocking or people making fun of these things. You know, back in the day and even now, um, you'll see that when you know, you saw like the, the the thing I always think about is just like the big hair that black women would wear in the 90s and how so many people would be like, oh, that's ghetto, or that's hood rat, or that's just unprofessional. But then you see people like Kylie Jenner doing the same thing and the Kardashians doing the same thing and they're being applauded and being called revolutionary or innovative. And it's like, no, you cannot be innovative when there's already a history and culture behind something. All you're doing is just regurgitating what you saw. So. Um, this picture again, perfect example, you know, we would see, I mean, I see this black woman and she looks good as hell. And yet there would be people that are like, oh no, she doesn't look that good. But then let somebody else wear the same thing, but they have lighter skin. It's like, oh my God, you look amazing. And like, there's like the microaggressions that can happen. So, um, but yeah, just a couple examples to think about. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide. Because this, we just start getting into examples. Like, again, you see those nails are tight. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, I'm like, damn, those are really nice. Um, but again, like, it's the extravagant, it's having those laid edges. Um, let's go to the next slide as well. It's a style. And, and I love this particular picture because of the quote that says, the fashion industry could never survive without us. And that's very, very true. So uh, let's see, let's go to next one. So yeah, just more examples of style. Um, you know, some are from obviously early 2000s, 90s, even like 80s styles too. Like you really can go back in time and see how many things were appropriated throughout history when it comes to Black communities and Black culture. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one. because I think it might be, oh yeah, perfect. Like a big one is, you know, Jeffree Star. <sighs> um, he, I mean, he's been around for a long time, but especially within like the last like 10 years, we, if like people would watch his YouTube channel, like he was a big user of like AAVE, having super extravagant nails, even like makeup trends, makeup trends that were happening throughout the last like 10 years were created by black women or created by black, um, black people. And people would just go and run with it. You know, a huge one that I always like see a lot that appropriates is like Fashion Nova. <laughs> fashion Nova, it's a fast fashion. And you see a lot of times, like a lot of that stuff comes from black communities. So <sighs> yeah, let's um move. Okay, let's get into this one. So, what is African American Vernacular English or AAVE? So, kind of going into like the history of it, it's rooted in both African dialects and/or Caribbean Creole English um, varieties. Um, there's a part of a cultural legacy that continues even after the transatlantic transatlantic slavery, which, you know, happened back, back in the day. Um, those who were enslaved invented their own separate version of English to speak with each other, forming unity, identity, and communication without interference from the white enslavers. So when, when AAVE is used by a non-Black person in verbal dialogue, in verbal dialogue, or, and on social media, 
it erases this origin while commodifying parts of black culture. Um, and I mean, like the best example is that a lot of times people think AAVE is called internet slang or like TikTok slang or Gen Z slang. And it's like, no, it's not. You know, we used to call this or my mom and my mom is, is, a, is a black woman, um, Ebonics. You know, they would say that there's that's what AAVE is. It's the it's Ebonics. So it's no Gen Z shit that you hear nowadays so um go ahead to the next slide i think this is where we'll have some yeah oh yeah perfect examples so um you'll see you know if someone's like oh that's extra or yeah that one's my favorite yes or yes queen um oh they woke or it's lit or when like if i don't really know you well and you're like, hey, sis, or I go off, sis. I'm like, no, I'm not your fucking sis. I'm not your sis. Only very few people get to say that to me. Or another one that I always like will do is like, girl. Like, girl, and I'm like, first of all, I don't even fucking know you like that. So I'm gonna need you to chill. Um, but we, this is also a really good example of commodifying it. Like we see these brands use AAVE in like their social media to try to be hit or try to be like, we're cool. Like this one right here, the Domino's pizza one, where it's like Domino's is bae, pepperoni kisses on fleek, hashtag millennials, hashtag nailed it. It's like, I'm gonna need you to change that hashtag to AAVE because that's what you're doing. Um, so there's like a lot of examples that we could easily dive into of appropriating like, Bad Barbie, the catch me outside girl. Perfect example of how someone who is non-black using AAVE and people eating it up. Or when, what's the, um, I think her name was like Aquafina. I think she's like a Asian um, actress. Her come up was her using a black scent. And then she started getting like more serious roles. And you notice that black scent disappeared somehow it was it was nowhere to be found so um you'll see that a lot of times people will use AAVE or use these black scents to try to like be very relatable like even Bretman Rock like even though there's been a lot of changes that he's made he still uses a black scent he still uses AAVE throughout his social media and stuff like that and it's like it it gets to the point where you start to once you start to understand and apply the knowledge of like, oh, this is AAVE, when you start to see non-Black people use it, it gets really cringy. So um, again, just examples. This is by all means not an exhaustive list of examples, but it's a good starting point if you wanna take that deeper dive and learn more about it and apply it to yourself so that way you're not um, committing microaggressions by doing that. So um, let's go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so this is gonna be really important for me and Brina, um, cause both Brina and I have backgrounds in dance. Um, I've been dancing all my life. Um, Brina, I think has been dancing all, all her life too. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, but a big thing that we both have been seeing within just dance in general, I mean, if we're talking about the history of dance, a lot of styles that we see nowadays originated from black communities, jazz, tap, um, at least those like studio styles, I should say. And then you can see street styles or club styles like crump. Um, if anybody has watched um, Rise, um, which came out in like the early 2000s, um, or if you've watched Paris is Burning, if you are a fan of Pose or Legendary, um, party dances that you'll see, like the, you know, the A-Town Stomp or like even like the Dougie or Jerking or whatever, those come from Black communities. And there's been a debate that's been going around, especially within the last couple of years, of being called a guest in these cultures and in these styles. Um, perfect example when I mean guest. 
so again hip hop is a big one um hip hop obviously start from black communities and black people if you don't if you don't hit that check mark you're considered a guest in that culture like with vogue vogue started from black and brown black and latinx queer trans people of color so if you are not able to check those boxes you're a guest in the culture and i think brina brings up a really good brina do you want to talk about that particular voguer that we've been talking about um and just how the lack of awareness of being a guest can cause kind of like implied harm in a sense yes um i am gonna be completely honest with y'all i don't know this woman's name i didn't care to dig into her whatever she got going on, because it didn't interest me. So in Vogue, in ballroom in general, um, for anyone that's involved or wants to, or is interested, they will tell you black and brown queer bodies to the front, because that's who it's for. This Vogue, she's white. I think she's, I want to say maybe Russian or something, but she has a huge platform. I mean, like thousands of followers and she gets views. I went to her page and I didn't see any black or brown faces, bodies on there at all. No promotion, no nothing. And that really makes me sad because here she is capitalizing off this culture that she's a guest in, but it seems like it's her culture. Like I see no, no um, credit given. I see no love shown. And it's just, it's really sad because at the end of the day, you are a guest you like it or not because these are spaces that were made for marginalized groups because they at this was at a time where they weren't able to express themselves freely and to be able to be let into that is actually a big deal and you should be grateful that you can't even be a guest you know but yeah that it's something that really frustrates me and irritates me because I see it all the time and not just in Vogue. And I think that in some cases, it does lead to our erasure, erasure because it's like, don't forget where this comes from and why it's here. Because if you allow too many guests in the house, um, it gets taken over. So something to think about. Sorry, Jasmine, keep, keep on going. No, because you really bring up some good points because again, I use this analogy when I teach students Vogue and stuff like that. I will always say, you're not going to go to somebody's house. If you are invited to somebody's house for whatever reason, you're not going to go into their house and tell them how they should live their fucking life or tell them how they should have their house set up. It's that same idea. It is an honor. It is a privilege that someone is trusting you to be in their space. And so a big debate that's happening is a lot of people view guests as a negative term. And it's, and it's really not. It's just kind of helping, again, lessen the erasure that happens. Um, a big thing with like Vogue dance and ball culture specifically is the terms shablam and death drop and how those are not terms. Those are those are culturally culturally appropriated terms within ball culture. So when you hear like Todrick Hall being like, shablam for me, shablam for me, shablam, it like that just further perpetuates the misinformation that goes out. And it's, which I will say right now, it is called a dip. It is called a dip when you see that move. Um, I know a lot of times in dance too, we see choreography specifically using different moves from these styles from like crump vogue party dances again like anybody who know, who's seen remember the time that michael jackson video where he's doing this that's the bart simpson and you see people will use that movement but are silent when issues are happening within black communities like i mean brain and i know this so many people that we know in the dance community have been silent for the last like couple of years when all of this stuff has happened and it but yet they will still post their videos of them dancing again regurgitating what they've learned and regurgitating what they saw and they get so much more recognition so much more opportunities 
versus the ones who originated it or it um or it's taught them so yeah there's a dance itself like just if we're talking about dance there's a lot of of dances again that come from black communities but you don't really get to teach that or you're not you, like you, you you don't get to learn that in classes because people don't take the time to talk about the culture so yeah I think I saw that there's like a question going on in the chat let me see really quick what oh, was you it? Read it out loud too oh yeah let's see which I mean, Tatra Call is black and queer, so that it so isn't that fine. That's a really great question. So the, the there you can still be black, queer, trans, whatever, and still uphold white supremacy and still uphold um cultural appropriation because you are it's something called like assimilating to whiteness. So Tadrick Hall, even though he is a black queer man still is perpetuating cultural appropriation because of the misinformation that he is spreading with saying it's a shablam. Um, which is really funny because with Todrick Hall specifically, Todrick Hall has booked people within ball culture and yet still continues to further perpetuate um, white supremacy by spreading that information, spreading cultural appropriation. If he would have just done his deal diligence and just said, dip for me, dip for me, dip, wouldn't have been an issue. RuPaul is another great example of a black queer man further perpetuating parts of white supremacy. Because again, if we look back, cultural appropriation stems from white supremacy. Full stop. Cultural appropriation stems from white supremacy. And it's a sad reality that, you know, black people can still uphold that too. So Todd Hall is a good example of how you can still be a part of the community and trying to assimilate to whiteness because you are able to get more opportunities or you don't have like a target on your back can be still very harmful at the end of the day. So. Um, I think that's how I'm going to answer that question. Brandon, is there anything that you want to add on to that at all? No, um, you got it right. In the day, you know, it's all about um, having the right edu um, information and being educated about it. There are some people that are also like part of the community that don't, that don't know about it because you got to remind yourself that this is, this is not something that is everywhere. Like, you know, the scene, even though it's getting more like limelight now, it's still pretty underground. Like you have to actually be in there to know certain things. Like that's why you have to talk to the pioneers, to the people that are, you know, involved so you can know the correct terms, the correct history. Because if we're gonna let, um, you know, mainstream media tell it, it won't be correct. So yeah, that's all. Yeah, so. Um... Let's go to the next slide. I think we've probably touched on dance as much as we can. Um, so uh, before we watch this video, I want to preference this that, so I there's a list of examples of, of black American hairstyles. The box braids, the laid edges, locks, cornrows, crochet braids, twists, fade hair, haircuts. There's all of these things are, you know, black American hairstyles. And we were all talking about it beforehand that, you know, the question we, that I think most of us as like black people have gotten is, well, like, why do you care so much? Or like, why is this hairstyle so important? And you have to understand that like, there was so much history that was lost due to colonization that it is very important that the parts that we have been able to keep are still sacred. And I think I can use that example with dance as well. There's a lot of dance styles, again, that have been colonized in a sense. And like a lot of people don't, a lot of people equate like tap dancing and jazz and stuff to like you know, white or non-black POC. And it's like, no, it started 
from black communities and they like think of it as an afterthought at the end of the day. Um, so just something to just definitely keep in mind when you're watching this particular video that there is a lot of culture and history that is enriched when it comes to these particular hairstyles. Um, so is there anything that you would wanna add Brina before we start the, the video? Yeah, um, so Black American hairstyles and Black African hairstyles, they're gonna be the same because obviously we're the same people. <laughs> um, but yes, based on what Jasmine was saying, you have to realize that although we're um, scattered across the whole diaspora, our hair is what connects us. And that in itself is a huge deal because you can't find another group on this planet that has the same kind of history. I don't care who brings up everyone was enslaved. I don't care. It was in shadow slavery. So don't talk to me about it. Um, I, I don't care if there was indentured servitude wherever. You will not find another group like Black people. You will not find our, our history, the way our hair was done, the way our traditions, you, you just won't find it. So hair is not just hair for us. It is us. It is, the, it is our identity. It's what holds us together. And if you can't understand that, then I don't know what to tell you, but it's something, we call it our crown for a reason, is I'm gonna say. There's a reason why it's called the crown. Okay, that's all. For centuries, our hair has been a way to express our creativity and culture. But imagine if it meant the difference between life and death. Hi, my name is Zainab Jay. I'm a freelance makeup artist from London and I work in film and television. Today I'm going to be recreating some methods of hairstyling that were essential for the survival of African people. For our people, hair has played an important role in survival. Our ancestors would place rice, seeds, and sometimes gold on the scalp between two sections of hair. They did this so that if they were captured and forced to voyage across the Atlantic, they'd at least have a small amount of food for sustenance. The technique was also used if they were planning a brave escape. Seeds and gold could help them build their new life. Finding out that people hid food and hair was really a shock to me, but I also wasn't surprised because I don't think there's a style that is more meaningful than braiding. It's been used for so many reasons throughout African history. It makes the style even more meaningful, even more powerful. It gives me even more of a reason to wear braids proudly. In the 1800s, African women were required to keep their hair covered in head wraps, except on Sundays, when some could remove the wrap and style their hair for church. When left with nothing but their spirit, resilience shone through. Butter and other household items were used to moisturize and condition. With no combs or brushes available, they'd use wool carding tools to comb through tangles. It wasn't much, but it was one little moment when they could feel human again. They'd even use baking grease for hair care and protective styling. If our hair could talk, it would tell you a story of power. 
there is no bad texture. Our coils hold the DNA of survivors. Be proud, be bold, be unapologetically yourself. Ugh, the power. <laughs> um, so let's really dive into the harm that can be caused when it comes to appropriating hairstyles from from black communities. Um, I mean, we have the perfect example on this slide, which is Kylie Jenner. <sighs> um, you know, the Kardashians are are a really great example of how. Black American culture has been commodified and also erased at the same time. Um, I mean, the perfect example is, you know, when people wanted to start calling it boxer braids and it's like, no, that's cornrows, like chill, chill out. There's some history and culture behind this. Um, you know, bonnets, like wearing bonnets and do rags, you know, you know, again, why people are wearing it. And it's like, ooh, it's the newest trend. But, you know, there's been a debate that's going around recently of like women not be like women shouldn't be allowed to wear bonnets out when they're running their own, um, running their errands or on the, they're at the airport and being like, oh, well, you need to be able to present yourself in a better way. Like that could be your next opportunity. And it's like, I don't give a fuck what my opportunity is. I'm trying to get my groceries. People can go out and wear their messy buns and go in and wear pajama pants out and about and nobody bats an eye. But black women specifically, or, or anyone, black person wearing a do-rag or a bonnet and they're not presentable enough like, how does that make sense at the end of the day? So again, great, Kylie Jenner is one of those great examples. Um, let's go to the next slide as well. <sighs> Sorry, I had to compose myself because the, the picture of the white woman with the crochet braids always makes me like laugh, um, <laughs> but let's let's just talk about the fact that first and foremost these styles are not made for hair on white people or some non-black poc let's just let's just throw that out there right now like these are not just styles that also deal with our identity but again these are protective styles for our hair these are it's enriched in cultural and his in history and for some other people like this white person it's a trend it's a trend and like look how foolish they look wearing this kind of stuff um a big thing that we talked about beforehand as well is that these like you're you're not going to be able to wear like wear that at job meeting at job interviews at times because they're going to judge you they're going to judge you. There has been times where we've had to, like, we were talking, like, there's, like, we've had to literally debate how we want to wear a hair for a job interview, because if we wear it a certain way, we not, we may not be able to get that job because we don't look, quote unquote, professional enough, which professionalism can also be rooted back to white supremacy too. But that's another conversation for another day. Um, is there anything that you would want to add at all, um, Brina? Yes, yes. Um, this is actually pertaining to the last slide. Um, I don't know if you want to go back, Janessa, or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, the head wraps, the headwear. Yeah, so um, headwear, head wraps in general, um, they, they've been a thing with Africans for a long time. Um, and they were kind of forced onto African Americans, like Black Americans. Um, if anyone wants to look up um, Tignan laws, I'll put it in the chat. It was a law in um, Louisiana where the black women were forced to cover their hair because um, it was quote unquote, making the white men want to cheat. Um, it was yeah, a very, very dumb reason. And that same, you know, 
the, the feeling of wearing a head wrap, it just carried on, like it kept going. But yeah, people don't know about this, but like there were some times in history where black women were forced to cover their hair. So that's why today you still see some black women that they still harbor those same um, sentiments like, oh, I should, you know, cover my hair. And we can talk about epigenetics and all that um, at another time, but I think it does play a role. But yeah, that's all I want to just add on about just the headwear stuff so people can get some more insight on it. Yeah, that's really good. Like some amazing points that you pointed out, Brina. Um, there's one question in the chat that I think I'm going to just address verbally, which is, could you please speak on wigs as well? Um, I'm going to make a really quick point about this. Um, with wigs in Black women, this kind of goes back to the idea of professionalism, right? So there's been many, many different times like in the past where our hair, and it still is a thing, where like, our hair is not considered professional. And so wigs were a way for, uh, for, for black women to, again, kind of assimilate to the idea of being presentable, but then it became something more than that. It, again, it's, you can use wigs in like all of these styles. Again, it comes back to identity and expression. So now, you know, you can really express yourself with wigs and how they are so beautiful at times. Like, I wish I could lay a wig down, like, but it's just, uh, I, I'm not good at it, me personally. I mean, I have no hair, so <laughs> that shows you kind of where my level is at when it comes to, to hair, but, um, but yeah, so like with like the history of wigs, you have to think about the idea again that our hair is, in the general sense of society is still considered not presentable or not like professional. And even um like hair, like hair nowadays, like the like the hair types and how the natural hair movement got like taken over by like people with like 3A, 3B, 3C hair. But it really started for like the 4C girls and that's how it started but then it got like ransacked pretty much from the looser curls because like yeah there's I could really rant about this for a very long time but yeah just when you like there's a particular article that I personally like and I'll probably try to see if I can throw it in the chat um but it's um it's from in style and the the name of the the article is black women's deep relationship with wigs isn't what you think it is it's quite complex so I'll try to find that really quick and add it into the chat but it's a really good starting point to really learn about the history and culture of wigs um because it goes actually a lot deeper than what I'm even talking about like it goes way way back we well, can talk like Egyptian like like ancient Egyptians doing wigs and stuff like that too but but yeah um going into cornrows um it they kind of talked about it in the video a little bit again of just like the historical significance of cornrows um you know obviously having food um using it as maps to you know get somewhere um and then you see it's, it's this picture always weirds me out the, the picture of the white man with the like, you just look at that and you know it's wrong. <laughs> like, there's no other way to really, like, explain it. Like, that is just, it's it's disgusting, first and foremost. It is extremely disrespectful. It erases the culture and thinking that there's no significance to it. And, again, it's a trend. It's a trend that people want to use without understanding the full impact that is made by disregarding the history and significance of these hairstyles um so so yeah uh what would be the next slide I, there's several examples um again like something as simple as like a fade you wouldn't think that that would be 
you know, a cultural appropriation. And I think that we, one thing that we definitely want to talk about here is the idea of microaggressions. So everybody get your phones out. Let's go to Google really quick. I want everybody to type in microaggressions, okay? Type that in, we're gonna read the definition together, okay? A statement, action, or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group such as racial or ethnic minority, okay? So, while it may not be somebody's intention to cultural appropriate, the impact that you make by doing so will cause harm, point blank, period. Now, I understand the idea, like we wanna make sure we, if you wanna have a clean cut, great, that's fine, but understand where it's coming from. Are you doing this particular style because it works well for your hair? Are you doing it because it's, you know, or are you doing it because you saw it, you thought it looked cool and you wanted to assimilate to be, to, to look cool? Let's think about that. You have to think about the unintentional at times of like, oh, is this what I'm doing rooted in any problematic things? So, um, let's see, I just saw, some. I'm wondering what you would say if someone said your short hair is appropriating white males. I would say, fuck off. That's exactly what I would say. I would say, fuck off. Because if we're really gonna get into it, let's talk about how black women can't even do stuff like this with, uh, without, being like, I'm trying to think of what the word is where not emasculated, but it's, it's the sense of like, like when I had hair, nobody questioned my feminine energy. But when I chopped my hair off, I've always been like my, my femininity is always in question now because of the fact that I choose to have no hair. And I, and I choose it for my own reasoning. I, I feel more empowered having no hair or having very, very little hair. And there are so many like people who have literally made me feel that I am less than a woman. Cause I also have, I understand that I do have several privileges in play here. I am a cis, I'm a cisgender woman. I am a mixed black person. So I am not fully black. So I also benefit from colorism which means I have more than a responsibility to be able to speak on these things because I know white folks would listen to me more than they would listen to a darker skinned person. So I need to amplify their voices. I'll make sure I'll tell people to shut the fuck up so that way they can listen to these voices. And if they still don't wanna get it and they wanna be disrespectful, I'll fight. I'll let this Aries energy run rampant at the end of the day for any person who needs to be heard. I know that's a very long-winded answer to that question, but if somebody says that I'm appropriating white males by having no hair, I could just definitely imagine that comment coming up. Um, and that is a common thing that comes up too with the wigs, people being like, well, black women appropriate white people when they straighten their hair. So I was just wondering like what a response to that would look like. Can I speak to that really fast? Please. Because um, I do hear this a lot, like um, with the whole lace fronts and all that. I do hear it a lot, like, oh, but you're appropriating like, you know, white, white culture because you straighten your hair, all that. Da, da, da. I just want to say that the whole um the idea of wearing wigs, what you know, covering our hair, all that stuff. Africans have been doing that for centuries. Like we've been doing the whole wig thing. Now the aversion of our hair texture that was introduced to us by white people. That is when it took a turning point. Like, oh, now your hair needs to be a certain way. Um, and I want to say that you can always try to point fingers, but at the end of the day, it does lead back to white people. When it comes to survival, to getting these jobs, to making it big, 
notice when you look at black women in the media, our hair texture, it's a no, it's a no. When you look at casting, like for auditions, they're looking for women with our, this kind of hair texture when you want to play a slave or do like black trauma. But if you want to be a love interest, when you get a good role, you're going to have to have straight hair. You're going to have to be looking like Zendaya. You're going to have to look a certain way. So yeah, white supremacy plays a big role in this. So if you want to point fingers like you're doing this, I want everyone that talks about Black women appropriating white culture for wearing straight hair to have the same energy for your white counterparts. You need to have the same energy for your white peers because they are the main reason why this is going on. You know, even me myself, I walk out and I have my hair out and I feel like I'm at a petting zoo. Is it petting zoo? Because people are constantly trying to touch my hair like I'm some kind of animal. You need to keep this energy for the people around you that are contributing to this. Like we won't see change until like you like the white side decides to make that change and accept our hair as normal. Like the, the whole, the othering, it has to stop. That's the only way. So no, I, I don't believe that black women are appropriating um, white people by trying to have straight hair. No, they're trying to survive. And, they're, and a lot of them, they wanna feel good in the way that the white standard has forced them to see like, oh, this is how you're beautiful. You have to have straight hair. That's not our fault. That is not our fault. You turn on the TV, you don't see yourself. You don't see representation of your hair texture. You never see it. You don't feel like you um, meet the standard of what it means to be feminine because it's not shown on TV. And we don't control that. White people do. Yeah, the phone call is coming from inside your house. Okay, all right. Can we just really appreciate Brina looking regal as fuck while checking everybody? Like, can we just like, yes, yes, damn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, um, let's go to the next slide because I think we've really kind of hit home why this these these conversations are important. Important, but like giving examples again, like, okay, twists. Like he tried to do the twist and his, his hair still came out the same way. Lauren Hill locks the whole idea of locks being like well vikings did that no y'all had dreads y'all had matted hair like no there is still going to be differences that happen okay so y'all can look this up again we've really kind of dived dived into the why behind we're having these conversations and we're giving we're we're having you turn your your cogs around in your brain but at the end of the day we're only here for maybe another hour it's going to be up to you to apply yourself and want to learn more and do more because again google is free all right so let's um let's go to the next slide because i really want to dive home into that particular video that you have janessa and and really make a point that again there are still real world implications and consequences for just being who we are so and i'm gonna just leave it at that i don't know if you want to add anything to that Brina, before we start the video I'm gonna pull up the video real quick. So now we're gonna actually show some real life examples of how black people just wearing their hair has led to being suspended from school, has led to not being able to walk at graduation, has led to not being accepted for an interview, has led to just absolutely every negative experience that you can imagine for just simply having black hair. Um, a lot of you probably saw this circulating on the news, I hope, but we have a Black teen who is Cinnamon? not allowed to walk at graduation Cinnamon? for his hair. Let's see. Now, I could start by removing a lot of things things for my diet and 
I'm just going to put that on mute because I do not want that. Notice how they just call him a black teenager. Like, what is his name? <laughs> Barbers Hill High School student DeAndre Arnold has always been a good student. A B student. He has dual credit classes that he's taking. You know, he's not a problem. But Arnold's mother, Sandy, says her son's hair has lately been a problem at the school and one that sent him to in-school suspension. This is a part of who he is, our beliefs. DeAndre's family is from Trinidad. He says a lot of the men in his culture grow their dreadlocks. These are pictures of some of his family members. I really and like that part of, you know, Trinidadian culture. So, I mean, I really embrace that. For years, his mother says he's had dreadlocks and always followed the school's dress code. The dress code is off the shoulders, above the earlobes, and out of the eyes. DeAndre wears his hair just like this, in which he says is in compliance with the dress code. But after Christmas break and just three months before DeAndre's graduation, his mother says the district changed the dress code policy. They say that even though my hair is up and off of all the regulations, that if it was down, it would be out of dress code. Not that I'm out of dress code, but if... I was to take it down, I'd be out of dress code, which doesn't make any sense. Because you don't take it down. I don't take it down in school. DeAndre's mother says she started to reach out to board members and the superintendent in hopes of coming to a resolution. But hasn't gotten a response. She says her son isn't allowed back to school and can't walk in the upcoming graduation until his dreadlocks are cut. Are you going to cut DeAndre's hair? Absolutely not. This is this is his belief. This this is a part of who he is. This is his culture. This is what we believe. So absolutely not. I'm not going to cut his hair. And now we're just going to open this up to anybody in the audience, but we'll start with our board members and panelists to talk about personal experiences that they've had um, with hair discrimination. I mean, I can go um, Oh, go ahead, Sabrina. <laughs> I've had um, actually a lot. Um, I think that not like to make it seem like being black is a monolith, but this is something that I think a lot of women with my hair texture can relate to, you know? Um, even like things you wouldn't even think about. For example, um, if you're a, if you want to go into cheerleading, you know, um, and you want to have your afro out, you can't. <laughs> so that's already something right there if you don't even think about. Like, you can't cheer with your afro out because you have to follow, like, you know, like what they put in their hair, all that stuff. That's one thing people don't even think about, like, for, for young Black girls. That's, they have to change that about themselves. Um, also, for, like, example, um, modeling. Um, I've been asked to do, like, certain, like, gigs and stuff, and, like, I'll show up and they'll have like sub to do straight hair <laughs> and that's it. So already right then and there, there's not much of an option for me. Um, and then even for like, um, I also um, with someone like for jobs, like I'd go into a store and I'd notice that everyone would have, um, you know, like straight hair. And if I don't match the store's, um, what you call it, look, look, which basically means white, <laughs> then they're not going to hire me because they're trying to appeal to a certain, a certain um, target audience. Um, and Jasmine put in the chat also in the studio dance world. Another big issue. Yep. Yeah. Your hair. When they do like, let's say, for example, you're doing like a, a feminine piece, you're doing hairography. How? With an afro. <laughs> it, it doesn't it doesn't translate you know so yeah there are certain aspects of certain fields that like our hair texture is not even considered it's like either you change your hair to fit the mold or you're not going to join us at all that's really much that's all that goes for that um but yeah I don't want to keep up you know too much of your, take up too much of your time I'll just leave it at that and let someone else go 
Hi, you guys. I'm Ayala. I'm the Director of um, Inclusivity and Equity for DIVA. I'm born and raised in Salt Lake City, face a lot of hair discrimination. I've seen a lot of my friends face hair discrimination, brothers, whatever. Um, I'm just going to call people out. If you go straight to your school policies from K through 12 education in Utah, you will see dreadlocks, afros, cornrows. You'll see something in there saying it, it, it's not allowed. Um, that's already, that's what young kids face every day on the daily. I can trace back to emotional trauma I face as a young girl. And I'm, I'm a mixed young girl. And speaking to about going back to the Brina's experience, she has a lot tight, tighter texture of pearls than I do as a mixed black woman. I still face something indifferent, even if I do have a light skin privilege. Black is not a monolith, but we face similar, similar, similar battles. So there's simply that. Um, I can't just go straight to the store, to a Walmart or something, and find hair products for my hair. That's also hair discrimination. Um, having to wait weeks for something to treat my hair rather than it to just be absorbed as something normal and inclusive at a store in Utah specifically is, is heartbreaking as a black person. Um, I played basketball for nine years. If I would wear my hair in a ponytail with my puff out, the referees would tell me that it needs to be put, put up and needs to be braided and needs to be doing this. Otherwise I won't be able to play. Like that's some bullshit. Um, there's just little things like that, that a lot of black people face across the country, but specifically in Utah, my Utah folks, because we have a lack of recognizing this discrimination that black people and other people of color face, um, just simply for their hair. So I can speak all day about my personal experiences because I live through this every day. Of, this is my life. I can't let go of my hair. I can't let go of my crown or my skin color, but it's important for you to acknowledge and see and call out white folks when you, they're discriminating against people of color for their hair. So I have to say. Yeah, I have one huge example um, of being like petted. And when I worked at Fashion Place Mall it was probably like the biggest time in my life that I had the most random strangers come and touch my hair. Um, but I was in line to get pizza and a woman walked up to me, put her hand in my hair and was like, oh, your curls are so pretty. My granddaughter has hair like that. Is it yours? Is it all yours? And then went forth to lift my hair up like this to try to see if I was wearing a wig. While I was in line, she was putting both of her hands on my body and lifting my hair like this. And Everybody else in the line was like staring at us. People got their phones out and started recording because they were like, I know this woman didn't just walk up and start touching her like that. And I just had to say, I had to say, this is my person. I don't know. First, I put my hands in her nicely curled hair that she it looked like she had just got done. And I ran my fingers through it. And I said, isn't that really odd to have a random human that you don't know touching your body and your face? And then I said, this is my personal square please do not enter it. And yes, this is all my hair. And that's another common microaggression that a lot of black women get is, is that your now, is that all your hair? Um, I think other than people randomly touching me all the time, that's the second comment that I get all the time. Is that all your hair? There's no way. Is that your hair? When I straighten it, people trying to pull it off. Um, growing up, people putting pencils in my hair at school 24 seven. Um, having teachers tell me that my hair is distracting or that it's blocking people. Um, like hair discrimination is a thing. And going off what Maella said, I also would encourage people to teach their children these things. A lot of people think that children are too young to learn about race and sex and discrimination. But as y'all probably have seen, children do pick up on those things and they do know when somebody's hair or skin is different and they will say something about it. So just having that conversation with your child and being like, if you see somebody who's different than you, you don't have to point out their differences, um, but acknowledge them and appreciate them. And like, you can ask questions, but try not to make them feel any different than they probably already feel being the only different person in the entire class. I can um, remember every person's name who 
like made me feel isolated from the group when I was a child. <laughs> I want to just um, add something because what Janessa just said literally like ah oh my god but the whole like is your hair real thing is such a common microaggression towards black women and um, I just want to say that it's 2021 and if you think that only black women would our wigs, weaves, extensions, you need to leave your bubble right now. Literally every single race of women wears weaves, wigs, extensions. It's not exclusive to only Black women. And the, the fact that people are so confident with putting their hands on only Black women is very telling. Because I have never seen this happen to any other race of women. I only see it with Black women. Like It's like people have this kind of like they feel like they own black women. Like they, they can easily put their hands on us. Like they, they own us, like, you know, like why, why do you feel so comfortable touching a stranger? But if I, for example, would go up to a white woman and touch her without permission, it'd be on the news. Like it would be on the news. So we have to ask ourselves, why is there this, is there this feeling of like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go pet that person when it's a black woman. Like, where does that come from? More people need to be checked about that. And I, um, I work with children and uh, my major is psychology. And I focus a lot on how racism and psychology go hand in hand. And I wanna say right now that um, children are not colorblind. Um, according to my studies, I think um, starting from like what, six months, they can tell who does and doesn't look like them. And the only difference between that is that racism is taught. So they know the difference between skin colors, but they don't know the um, negative connotations that are attached to it. That is all taught through media and parenting. So when my children, when I go to work, my, my children at work, because I work at a preschool, when they come like, oh, Miss Sabrina, like, I like your hair. If they ever reach out to touch it, I tell them, no, it is my body. And I have to say yes first. You need to ask me, Miss Sabrina, can't touch your hair. You don't touch people without no, without their consent. That's not okay. And it's really it's a simple conversation, right? You'd be surprised how many parents don't do it and how many grown adults don't understand that concept. Consent is important, no matter who it is. I don't care if you're just giving a pat on the back, whatever. You need to say, hey, your hair looks really nice. I was wondering, would you mind if I were to touch it? because the texture is lovely. Just your delivery is everything. And you know, you'll realize that sometimes people they'll be like, oh yeah, of course. But just to come up and like, no, it's a chop, it's a chop. So yeah, but Janessa, yeah, you really brought up some really good points and it, it juggled my memory like, oh my gosh, I should bring this up. Thank you. Um, I know that where I, cause I really don't want us to like run over time and stuff. So I'm just going to quickly go through my experience. Um, so I, so my mom is, um, a, like, again, my mom is a beautiful black woman. Um, but she was, she, she's very much that black woman that was like assimilated to like having to straighten their hair all the time. And so I actually had to like me, going through my natural hair journey didn't start until I was 22. Um, I'm 27 now because my mom would straighten my hair all the time. She would do the, the relaxers in my hair. I still have, and I think it's, you can kind of see how I'm thinning more on my edges. That is from years of relaxer damage that just, like my hair grows a lot thinner now on my edges and kind of on like the back of my head too. Um, because my mom thought that like, oh, straighter hair is going to make me be more accepted. And even now to this day, my mom, she straightens her hair still. Like, even though I've tried to like help her in her natural hair journey, cause she had, so I have like a combination of three, three B, three C, four A and four B hair. Like my, my hair, my hair is like a combination of a lot. My mom has four B, four C hair. Um, and so as much as I've tried to help her in her journey of natural hair, she still straightens her hair to this day. And my mom is going to be 60 in October. 
so it's again there's a lot of like real world implications of like the assimilation that's had to happen for for black women to be just to a, a kind of like what we've been saying just to survive and so um everything that everyone's been saying like having their hair touch being pet asking if it's real i've gone through all of that but like my biggest thing that's impacted me is the fact that like i've been having to work with my own mom who you know, is my mom, has taught me things, has, has taught me how to be a, a human being. I'm teaching her how to accept herself and accept who she is. Like my mom is such a huge impact in my life. And she, she already deals with enough discrimination as it is being a black woman in Utah, but also being a black woman in Utah who has vitiligo, which where she has patches of uh, depigmentation. Um, and having people like literally look at her like she's like different and like having her having like having to like hype my own mother up to be like no mom you are a beautiful black woman regardless of what you look like like regardless of the patches that you have you are still a black woman like i'm teaching my mom that to this day so that's like my impact that's come with this kind of stuff too so I'm going to get her cute little wig too for her birthday because, you know, she's going to be stunning. <laughs> My sister in the industry and I'm trying to help her love her curls, but it's, 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 it's a struggle. So the next Black and African hairstyle we're covering is box braids. So we've covered some of the history of these hairstyles, but also just want to cover the fact that these hairstyles are not meant for white hair. You don't have the texture for them. Um, when, we, when we get our box braids, we keep them in. I kept my last set of box braids in for four months on my hair, probably washed my hair like once a month throughout that process. Not many white people can wash their hair once a month and not many white people can keep braids in their scalp for four months straight. And this is an example of what can happen if you do try to do these hairstyles on your own. And it went like so it's more than also like the history and it's also just the type of hair that we have and how these styles work on our hair. Yeah, um, this is a quick example. Obviously, Bantu knots, um, Adele, girl, what are you doing? Stop that. Stop what you're doing. Um, but yeah, again, I think we can easily go through these examples because um, we've already touched on the why. So let's go. Um, Brain, I think you were taking this one, right? Yes. Um... Okay yeah it's pretty much you'll these are also styles that like you also see on black americans um they're traditionally african styles but of course you're going to see them in america too um so these are the braids that kim kardashian wore and she said they were boxer braids um they're actually fulani braids um they have different names around the country um yeah the boxer braid thing that's not a thing i don't know where she got the idea from, but that like does not even exist. Yeah, this hairstyle ties, ties back directly to African roots. Um, it wasn't even in the States, like even Kim herself, like saying that like, it just, it's not from the States, it's directly from Africa. And there's a lot of significance between the style because some women like um, in this picture, you'll see this one, she has like um, beads in them. You can put beads, you can put like um, shells in the hairstyle. And it's, just, it's very common like, among like young girls to wear this. It's like, you know, like a, a cute style to keep your hair neat or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know who did her hair, Kim Kardashian's hair, but it looks very basic. Like the, it's a very basic version of the style. Like the style is meant to be very like, how do I say, like extravagant and like is supposed to make you look like, you know, nice and hip and stuff. And on her, it's just like, what is the flavor? Like it's just braids. 
So Fulani braids usually are not supposed to be like that. So first of all, they're like they're, the present, presentation of the braids is wrong. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and now we're going into appropriation from, from Black Africans. So I am from Gabon. It's a small um, Central West African country. It's around the coast, on the equator as well. Um, Population of like 2 million. There's not many of us around in the States. Usually we stay in our country or we go to like France or something because we're a Francophone country. Um, my parents are from two different ethnic groups. Um, some people use tribes. Uh, I prefer to use ethnic groups because I feel like the word tribe makes it seem like it's a small group of people when it's really not. Like the, the verbiage is just not, it doesn't make sense. So uh, the Fong people is my dad's um, ethnic group and the largest, largest group in Gabon. And the Batike people found in Congo and Gabon because um, most people know that Africa, like the borders are kind of fake. Like you'll find the same people like in different countries like the border between Gabon and Congo is not, I don't believe in it. Because as you can see right now, like my people are found in two different countries, making any sense, you know? Um, next slide. All right. Uh, African attire, seeing it become mainstream and like in the fashion world is very, very awkward to me because this woman, what she's wearing right now, this is not something that we would consider um, high fashion. This is something that moms wear at home when they're like cooking and cleaning and chilling. This is basically lounge wear. And someone took this and they made like, oh, this is high fashion. Like, no, this costs like $10 at the market. So that's weird. And the dashikis, I, this, this kind of triggers me because I remember growing up and like wanting to hide the fact that I'm African because like I would get bullied so much for being African. Like people just hated it. They would have all the, they'd make all the jokes. They'd ask me weird questions. Like this was also when um, growing up in Colorado, um, Cornwells and stuff had not reached the black community here. So no one was really wearing any um, African styles in their hair, but me. So it like doubled down on me. Yeah, with dashikis, everyone was wearing them, trying to make it a fashion statement. Once again, dashikis are lounge wear. <laughs> they are not anything that you would consider high fashion. It's stuff that you wear at home or when you're cleaning or chilling, you wouldn't really wear that shit to a party. Um, next slide, please. Head wraps. Um, okay, there's a video for this one. Um, if anyone wants to Google, there is a influencer named, uh, what is it? Patrick Starr, and he had worn uh, some kind of, he called it a turban, which it was not. And he was saying that he had an extravagant look. Now, okay, let's talk about what he was wearing. It's called a gele, and it's not. It's Nigerian. It's not a turban. It's what many women wear. It's like it's it's to dress up. Like for weddings, they would wear it. Um, you know, they wear it to church. They wear it like for outings. You know, that um, have like a different kind of dress code. Yeah. So everyone wants to look that up. Google Patrick Star gele, um, and you'll see what that was about. Very, very weird, very just, he tried to make it seem as if this was just some kind of look that he that was put together for him or something. And I was like, no, you're basically appropriate West African culture right now. And while is the one that I seem most similar to, just know that around that region, many African women, we do wear the head wraps as you see in this video, like we have our own versions of them. Um, but yeah, if you wanna play the video, Janessa. Millions of African women all over the world are now wearing head wraps, and everyone from top African celebrities to even presidents are donning the head wrap. Welcome to Tuna Chicken, and in this video, we present five reasons why African women wear head wraps. Remember to subscribe and ring the notification icon so you don't miss any of our African videos. 
Number five, a form of expression. Head wraps are seen as an edgy form of expression and boldness. Many African women who disown Western standards of beauty use head wraps to show originality and individuality. They create all sorts of elaborate designs from pulling, wrapping, and tucking until their living artworks become a beautiful creation atop their heads. Number four, as a fashion statement, African fashion is now on the mainstream and head wraps are on the front line of the new edgy African statement looks. With amazing designs, practical natural hair protection purposes and easy to achieve looks, African women are now turning to head wraps as a go-to look. Number three, for religious reasons. Some African women believe that covering their heads engenders a certain spiritual state and conveys a message of purity and godliness to many observers. As a result, some of them who do not wear head wraps all the time may do so for religious occasions or when inspired to do so. Number two, as a cultural statement, Many African communities believe wearing a head wrap accentuates a woman's beauty by drawing attention to the face and away from the hair and the body. This is because in many African cultures, the face is more important as a place of beauty than is the body. And head covers facilitate this focus towards the face, facial expressions, and the conversations. Number one, for historical heritage. Historically, African women wear head wraps symbolizing a crown. This holds a distinctive position in the history of African dress for both its longevity and for its potent signification of both glamorous and African royalty. Since the days of ancient Songhai, Nok, Congo, Egypt, Akan, Aksum, and Nubia. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to catch the latest African news and Yes, um, I love that video. But yeah, now we're gonna go into waist beads. Now I was really shocked to see this <laughs> reach mainstream media because like, what? <laughs> okay, waist beads are a traditional African accessory that consists of small glass beads on a string or wire worn around the waist or hips. In Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, and other West African countries, waist beads are a symbol of femininity, fertility, sensuality, and spiritual well-being. Um, my country, Gabon, we also wear waist beads as well, um, but we're considered, we're considered um, Central African. But okay, so... I have a memory of my aunt. She came here to give birth. She lives in Gabon, but she came to give birth and um, she had put waist beads on her, on her newborn baby. And my grandma was so mad about it. She's like, you don't put them on a baby. Why do you put waist beads on the baby? We don't do that. It was like a huge conversation. But like now I'm like fast forwarding to today and like, there's random people just wearing waist beads. Like it's just an accessory. I'm seeing it's on Shein. I was on a website called, um, I was on a website called Dolls Kill. They call it like camp beach, something like that. And it's very interesting to see how this has taken on and how everyone is just rocking the waist beads. Like it's very, very interesting. There, yeah, some women just wear them. And I asked them like, that's cool. Like, why do you, why are you wearing like, oh, this looks cute. I'm like, once again, Africans receive no credit because that's what it does. Cultural preparation is when people take things and they basically forget about the people that made this thing they love so much. And I will have to say that I believe a lot of it is rooted in people seeing Africans as inferior. Like they don't want to acknowledge that things that they like so much can come from a group that they find so inferior, which is why they try to erase us from the, from the connection. Like this is African culture you're rocking, but you don't have respect for the people. It's wild to me. So yeah, here's more pictures. Um, this is like the real deal.
I have a question. Can we talk about the irony of the pics in this example of white people really? Yes, right? So that's- I just wanted to point that out. I really did, because I know no, we pointed that out before. Because it literally though, it was like, that was like the perfect example of appropriation. The fact that you type in waist beads, the ones that are being sold, literally white, 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 white. But then right there in the small print, it says traditional African accessory. What? <laughs> and something that I want to point out that this also ties into. Uh, okay, so you see how a lot of, um, it's not even just, there's a lot of things to talk about with African culture, but we're trying to keep this, you know, in a certain time frame because we can go all day about it. But the fact that people are making so much money off of like our culture and African people are still not getting shit, that's what makes me very, very angry because our society is very capitalistic. What is the best form of support if not money? So you're basically, you're consuming our culture, you're taking all of our stuff, but like, yet the people, the actual people, are not getting anything. Like all this money is not going to Africans. <laughs> it's not. So that's what really frustrates me. Like if if our stuff is really this popping, we should be rich. Rich as hell. This also goes for um, Black American culture. Our stuff is this popping, and we're not rolling in money. The math yeah. is not mapping. The math is not mapping. That means that our, our stuff is being consumed and the money is going to other things. It's not going to us. And that's something to think about when you're talking about cultural appropriation is that all, the, all these funds, the people that's making this stuff, they're not getting the funds. Like they're still being discriminated against. They're still living in um, you know bad conditions. They're still not cared about so how you taking our stuff? Like if you if you wouldn't if we didn't exist, you wouldn't have it. So something to think about. And I think that concludes our presentation. Um, after the slide, yes, it does. All the way through. Um. So yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just read this. Um, Diva is a brave space. Now is the time to ask any questions that you wouldn't normally be able to ask in everyday settings. Yes, we are very um, open, straightforward. We will tell you like it is. If you have any questions, please feel free. We're all ears. Yeah, for real, if y'all, or any comments, anything you learned today, this is kind of like the only time we have to actually interact with one another. So we would love to hear anything that y'all have to say. And if you don't want to speak, you can also put it in the chat and we'll read it out loud and answer it, and answer it verbally. Also another. I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. This was a beautiful presentation. And I am so, so happy that I got to learn so much from this and then also um, help my little Jazzy, who's a mixed child in which she has a lot of questions that I haven't been able to answer. So I just thank you, Janessa, all of you ladies. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for that. Like, I'm glad that you enjoyed this and you got something from it. I care a lot about what people can receive from what I say, you know? But um, let's see, there's a question here that says, in regards to AAVE, how do you feel about non-Black people who have grown up in predominantly Black communities who do use AAVE because they grew up surrounded by it? Okay, I can answer this one. So I have a friend um, who's not Black who actually did grow up around Black people. And the thing about that is that you can tell, okay, like we know who's a fraud and who's not. Like, it's very obvious. My friend has his own business. He, you know, he's in the adult world now. And since the day I met him to today, he still speaks the same. It does not matter who he's around. You ask him, he'll tell you, yes, I grew up here and here. Like when we immigrated to America, we were in this neighborhood. Like, this is what I know. This is who I know. And this is why I'm the way I am. His music sense, like his fashion sense, who he hangs around, 
you know this person was brought up by black people like you it's obvious he's not a fraud it's how he grew up it's the people that all of a sudden developed this um this black scent out of nowhere you gotta question them you know like so where this come from where'd you learn this because you grew up in the suburbs so yeah for that question you can tell i don't feel like it's anything anything bad about them just the same way as if uh for example me like, like i spent time in um the city and in the suburbs like i can tell when people haven't been interacting with certain spaces like you, you can tell and there's nothing wrong with either one it's when you're you're faking stuff that starts to piss me off next question if we wanted to donate food or, or clothes or anything where, where would we go um i'm sorry the are you talking about like in general or like for like african or black american if you want to just specify that would be nice oh, i'll just answer for both um, I think the most important thing is to, um, look for resources and by that is to people like Janessa here and me you know, like their, their resources, like in your, within your community. Um, and also if you can to go directly to like black owned shops, African owned shops, like give them that support. That's all I can really say. I don't like to donate to organizations like online that'd be like, oh, um, save the children, whatever. Cause my thing is like, y'all been having these commercials for like years. How come the children ain't fed yet? <laughs> what y'all doing? Yeah, you need to go to a direct source. Like if you go, if, if you go to a program that's um, I, I guess led by like people in that group, you're more likely to, your money's gonna go somewhere. Like, you know where it's gonna go. Big organizations, I don't trust. People have their own opinions about that, but that's just me. Can I piggyback off you real quick too, Sabrina, on that? Mm -hmm. um, I So, and I'm actually really big on this too. And I think Brennan knows this as well. Um, whenever I donate my money, I'm donating it directly to someone whether it is a trans person, a queer person, a black person, like actually just like just recently, um, I, I had a black non-binary person reach out to me and was like, Hey, I really need some help. Um, you know, and I gave the money that I could at the time, but they needed more than that. And so I was like, okay, well, do you feel me comfortable? Like going and like saying, Hey, I'm directly getting, trying to get money for this person can like send me the money and they were like yeah because they were afraid to do it you know and it's like that kind of stuff like when you really you can see the impact that is being made when you're donating directly to these like black owned stores black owned organizations or just black people in general and and this is the thing is like that's like and 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 I've talked to Brian about this before like I I don't publicize it like I don't try to make it a public thing being like look what I'm doing because again like, like that's not the that's not the point like I don't need clout I don't need these things like these like I, I don't need that validation from people to do the right thing at the end of the day and like with organizations like Brina brought up a good point it's like why are we still having these messages being made or the marketing and, and and I'm I'm majoring in marketing like I totally understand the meaning of product placement price promotion I get all of those things but again it's why are we still having these conversations why are these children not being fed why are we still having violence happen towards black people like again there's waste beads that are on sheen for three dollars but where the fuck's that going? Hmm? Like, what's an ad? Get it, and the money goes straight to her. But you know, yeah. Like, and like, I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm a really big person on like black, like supporting black owned like businesses and stuff. Like a lot of stuff that I buy now. Um, you and and I and I and this is gonna be me holding myself accountable. I wasn't really with the shits until like probably the last five years of my life like I I have come from a very 
colonized background and it, and I, and you know, obviously like I didn't know any better, but now that I know better, I'm going to do better. So like a lot of things, like I buy, like actually hold up, I'll show this one particular one. It's my favorite. So this one, so I buy candles. I I'm a big candle person. I love candles. Just love them. This one it's called hide and park co it's a black owned candle shop. Um, it's online. You can buy their stuff. Like just something like little as this, like I, I it's, it doesn't take that much energy to support your people or support the people who need it at the end of the day. Yeah. I also want to just say that there is a really big importance with um, supporting the people directly, like in terms of like shopping where they, where it's black owned, because um, a good example is here in Colorado, um, we just got our very first, first black owned um, Cajun Creole food spot. You know how crazy that is to me because we have um, Creole Cajun food around here, but guess what? They're all Asian owned. Now that says a lot about how like we're getting erased. We're really getting erased because if I didn't know any better, I would think that, you know, this food is Asian. <laughs> Cause like, it's, it's all like, that's all I'm getting here. But like, yeah, so I don't know. I just, I make it a deal. I make it a, a, a big deal to actually give money where it's due. Even like with um, Beauty Supply, the, we had one here that was um, the first black owned Beauty Supply. They closed sadly, but yeah, I made sure like, you know, I'm gonna stop by and give y'all some coin. Cause I like that you guys are open, that you're around because honestly, if anyone knows black women spend the most money at the beauty supply, but how come we don't get like a chance to own the, you know, own some businesses in there too. Like we should be owning it as well. So definitely, yeah, just think more about how you can give directly rather than trying to find these organizations you know, the money's going to, um, but yeah, um, that's all. Any other questions? Yeah, so I have a response to Wien's question as well, which I think y'all hit on it, like we can tell the difference, um, but something I actually had to tell one of my biracial friends that passes as white um, is that, and it's a different story for him since he actually is biracial, but most white people, if they were raised um, in a predominantly, predominantly POC area and they do speak that way, I just say go out of your way to just let the people of color around you know that so that they don't feel uncomfortable. Um, because of course, right off the bat, we're gonna think, oh, they're just around a bunch of people of color. So they're trying to talk a certain way. But as soon as like, oh no, I actually was raised here. I'll, and then they can say like, oh, like all my friends are black growing up and this is just how I talk. Then we're all gonna be like, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, but, and I've definitely had that experience a lot of times in Utah where I've seen like a white girl with a black boyfriend talking like that. I'm like, girl, what's going on here? And usually if they say that they're from a certain area, I'm like, okay, that's great. But yeah, I would, I always encourage those people to just give a little disclaimer and let the other people in the room know first so that there aren't any awkward, um, encounters. And then I wanted to ask everyone in terms of cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. Um, when is there ever a time to cult, like culturally appropriate thing, something like in a, in a white manner? Like um, I'm thinking an example for myself is I nanny a lot of white children and some of them have very kinky curly hair. So sometimes I'll ask their mom like, oh, do you want me to braid it up? do you want me to braid it up for them? Cause their hair texture actually can take it. So there will be some little white girls running around in cornrows or like little box braids, but I did that to them. And um, like, I think with appreciating someone's culture, like what if somebody's friend from Africa brought, brought them back a dashiki and was like, oh, I got this from my home country. I'd like for you to have it. And then they wear it like, is there a way to kind of appropriate culture that's okay? And what does that look like? Yes. Um, I think Maya's hand was raised first, so. Go ahead, I'll go after you. <laughs> the moral of the story is to give credit to the Black people. Like that's any across any cultural appropriation. Even with Ebonics, you tell them, I grew up in the hood with some Black people. 
That's why I talk the way I talk instead of over here, call me sis and queen every five freaking seconds, you know? Um, on top of that, when it comes to hairstyles, again, give credit to where it's due. Like my nanny, Janessa, hooked me up. I didn't go to some white person that's over here braiding and doing cultural appropriation as she speaks. Um, you're still supporting black people at the end of the day. So if you go, if you go to an app, like we have one, probably two black beauty shops. And I swear, African women be braiding hair. If you paying three hundred dollars to her, go ahead. But if you go on a great clips and they're freaking box braided hair in there, I that's when you're appropriating. So yeah, just give credit to where it's due. That's the moral story. Uh, yeah, I I agree. Um, also, um, I want to just um, say that. So the, with the whole gifts thing that Janessa said, realize that because um, in Africa it's pretty much um, homogenous, so racial dynamics don't work the same there as they do here. So most Africans, like even my family back home, they don't they don't understand like why we get very angry about certain things. For example, like my aunt, if she does a white girl's hair, she'll be like, okay, I'll do her hair and then she'll pay me. She doesn't know like the implications behind that, like what happens here in the States. You, you see what I'm saying? So if an African person is giving you a dashiki to wear, like it's not wrong to wear it because they gave it to you from a place of love. You know, you would just explain like, oh no, this is actually like, it's a meaningful gift to me because it was given to me by someone I appreciate. And it was a gift, so I want to wear it. So that's why I think like that's appreciation because you you want to appreciate what was given to you. So it's a whole different story than someone that's like just going to buy it and be like, look at my new shirt, you know? Like the, the intent behind is not the same. On top of that, it, the money was given to where it's due. Yes. Like, that's the moral exactly. story. <laughs> yeah. I think if anything, if there's anything I'm going to add to any of this is just like read the damn room read the room like sometimes yes like I, I there's a lot of things like that I have gotten from my friends from their culture that I 100% appreciate but I don't flaunt it in that sense of like look what I got look at this da, 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 da. it's it's like if you are if you got a gift or if you grew up in that particular neighborhood yes it gives context to you know where you are at within your journey but even at the end of the day like if a white person is was grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood that still does not give them the right to use aave or use um the n-word you know like uh, if if you are a white person that grew up in a black household where they were able to do you know, box braids and protective styles, that still doesn't give you the right to be able to do that. Because at the end of the day, it's those implications that happen after the fact. And, and this is where we have to really talk about um, impact or intention versus impact, um, where even though it may not, wasn't your intention to be cultural appropriated because you thought you were appreciating the culture, it can come off as cultural appropriation because of the way that you, your impact and intention didn't align. So read the fucking room. Yep. yep. Um, I know we had Andrew and Lou that had questions. Um, I think Lou was first, if I recall. You wanna ask your question? No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I personally change my hair a lot. I always try to you know, make sure I'm not overstepping boundaries. And I just want to make sure that I have very straight hair. So I've never thought about getting braids. I will braid my hair, but, you know, like a regular braid or whatever. Um, scarves, though, I'm curious because, so I actually grabbed one of mine. I wear it more like a headband. Um, I, I do, though, want to always make sure that I'm not appropriating you know, because I think they're pretty and beautiful, but I would never wear it in a way that like wouldn't go with how my hair would be. Does that, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like I, I would wear it more like this, just like as a headband. So I guess my question is, is that something that I need to be more aware of because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to 
represent something that I am not a part of. I want to be very like inclusive or maybe I didn't word that correctly, but do you kind of understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Um, I see nothing wrong with the way you did your, you did your um, head, like you described. Um, it's a really, it's a really distinct way of tying a hair scarf. Like you'd have to actually go out of your way to make your hair look like a head wrap. Like it's it's more than just like tying. Like there's actual like steps to do. I saw this as well on YouTube because this is a very intricate way of doing it. Um, so un unless you, you find yourself having to actually YouTube these videos to learn the steps to do it, you're probably not appropriating. <laughs> just saying, you're probably not. Yeah, I I would agree with Sabrina on that as well. Like you know, like headbands, like. Head, there's there's gonna be I think every culture has like some kind of significance when it comes to headbands but again it's how you're wearing it like um like even me like I personally just learned that like because I used to do the head wraps when I when I did have hair um and I used to call it a turban and I was like again as I've gone through my decolonization journey I realized that that's not the right thing um so it's just like taking that time to do your research. And I think the biggest thing is applying that knowledge, you know, like the fact that you questioned it is already like, that's the first step. You always want to make sure you always want to question yourself, like, and always like double check with yourself. Like, okay, this isn't, this isn't this, this isn't this, this isn't this. Okay, good. Go about my day, you know, and I, and I, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a skill set. It really is where you do have to take that time to invest in yourself. So that way it can become second nature. Um, but the fact that you're already questioning that is like, you're, you're doing amazing, sweetie. <laughs> right, Thank you. Andrew, Andrew, I think. Yeah, Andrew. Oh. You saw your question, Andrew. You think Andrew? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I this is my first uh, Zoom, which is crazy now that I think about it. But uh, this has been really great to hear. Uh, so my sort of uh, so basically, uh, I grew up um, in Georgia, in um, when I was growing up, uh, the only people who remotely accepted me for being gay were all people of color. <laughs> so I've always felt really conflicted because I basically grew up hating white people. <laughs> um, just because uh, classism and, and uh, homophobia. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, like I've definitely had like, uh, and, and a, a, a very late <laughs> awakening um, that that happened throughout 2020 and trying to um, internalize all the aspects that I'm supposed to be uh, I'm supposed to make myself aware of and stuff like that so like I just can't I, like all of this like I would never I've never thought of touching somebody's hair so it just like so much of this is just mind blowing to me that and that that incidence like this like like that incidence of the, of of all of this racism just like keep happening it just blows my mind that someone would not I don't know I, I, I like I I don't really know what I'm how I'm supposed to work with white people because it, it's it's like the people who need to be listening to this are people I would never talk to in my life because I would just uh, not feel safe as a gay person trying to talk to somebody straight about stuff like this. So I don't know. I, I it's one of those things where, like, like in reevalu in reevaluating, like I re I like I clearly remember instances where like I was racist, and I look back and I recognize oh. <laughs> When I was a freshman in high school, I asked a black kid why he was using a hair pick. And I and and so it's just like retroactively, I can like do some of the work. I will I can kind of correct my younger self, if that makes any sense. Um, 
So I don't know what I'm trying to say. Point is, um, I can't believe everything that you all put up with and uh, just sending you all the power. So anyways, th th that's all, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Andrew. Um, you stepping up and being brave and entering this space with us and sharing your experience with working through racism and your past experiences with it, especially coming into this conversation as a queer person. Um, just know that Diva always brings a safe space for you to just vent too. Like it doesn't even have to apply to the conversation as long as you can connect with each other. That's the whole purpose. Um, can I take that real quick too? Um, being a, a, a queer person of color, um, I totally understand, yeah, like, I, I understand that whole idea of, like, I'm not gonna say hate white people, because that's not what this is, <laughs> but it, again, the, I've noticed there's this, this weird intersectionality that comes into play with queerness and, and being of color, and how there's, like, an oppression Olympics that can happen at times, and it's, like, you can be there's so many different things that can envelop someone's identity and understanding. And it's a lot of work. Again, this, like, I already know I am making a lifetime commitment to decolonize myself. And it, I think even if I were to like speak like four or five years ago, I would have never been able to admit that like I benefit from colorism. I would have easily used the same excuses that people use you know, people of color views being like, oh, well, this, 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 and try to use oppression Olympics. Um, and it's like, no, I can admit that I have benefited from the, the system of colorism. You know, it's, 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 it's understanding the space, like it's understanding what spaces you partake in and how you take that space. Like me being a queer person of color in a professional <laughs> setting, is going to look different being a queer person of color at a ball or at a, a, an event that's catered to POC or catered to queer trans people or, you know, so, so it's, it is a lot of brain power, but it's worth to make the investment because then once you understand the space that you are in, you then can understand the space that you take and how you can either uplift, support, and still have a good time and still, you know, feel fulfilled as an individual too. Um, so that's my tidbit. <laughs> okay, I have one question that was sent to me privately that I think we should definitely address before we wrap everything up. Let's try to definitely get this cut off by 310. So I'm still on the cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. When we talk about box braids, you specifically mentioned that it's not meant for white woman hair. But what about Pac like myself? This person is half Nicaraguan, um, half Polynesian. Um, I love the maintenance on my hair when I do get box braids or cornrows like Jasmine said. I like how I don't have to do my hair for months and it makes getting ready faster and easier. I also like how it looks on me. I always go to black people to get my hair braided so I can support black culture. But after listening to everything that was said today, I'm questioning if I'm appropriating black culture. Okay, um, do you wanna go Jasmine or should I? Um, <laughs> you know what, Brina, I'm gonna let you go first. <laughs> All right, um, with this question, so you said you're half Polynesian, half Nicaraguan. Are you, okay, so are you, because I know that Latin America, like, you know, Latino Latin is not a race. So are you non-Black Nicaraguan? Or are you, like, are you trying to say that you're, like, you're, you're mixed race? Or like, you know, like, give us like some more um, specifics. Also, what's your hair texture? Like, we know that as well, because not everyone has the, you know, not every non-Black person has the same kind of hair texture is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. There's a chance your hair texture actually does do well with this maintenance style. Also, another thing I also want to address is when you partake in like anything Black, do you address the anti-Blackness in your community? I always ask that question. Do you address it? Because I'll say it, Polynesians be anti-Black too. 
non-black Latinos are also anti- anti-black. Mm-hmm. You, you take up for the people. Because if you're answering no to some of these questions, you need to do some self-reflection, okay? Are you confronting the anti-blackness within yourself? That too. Like, cause, and I think that's a, like, I really love that you asked for that context because that's a big thing. A lot of people do, um, a lot of people do mistake race and ethnicity as like the same thing. So like, again, that's, I love that you put that context there with being, so I, um, so I personally, like, I'm very involved within the Polynesian community here in Utah, even though I am not Polynesian myself. Um, and I, like, there's a particular, so there's a particular person that I'm thinking of in my head. She literally has the same texture as, as Janessa. Like, I, like, same hair texture, same everything. She decolonizes herself. She is outspoken she uplifts people but her hair texture can handle those protective styles so yeah so I think you I think you know who I'm talking about I do, right I do. yeah I know that's what it is because I had questions I was like um <laughs> yeah no so yeah she um and and also too like she and I actually just found this out recently um that there is cultural significance of like protective styles it's not going to be the same way it's very similar but it's not the same like dread like like locks for Polynesian people has a very different cultural significance than locks in black culture and black communities and um that was something that I like just recently had learned about because I was gonna I actually had called out I was like calling out somebody and being like you're cultural appropriating and then like they sent me stuff and I was like Let's let the person answer the question. So you ask, are they Black Nicaraguan? Are they, um, are they speaking? Some more, yeah. Some more so let's have them answer. Yeah. So I am a non-Black person of color. Um, I'm half Tongan and half Nicaraguan, and I my hair is curly. It can take the more protective style form. But I was just after listening to everything wondering if I am culture appropriating versus culture appreciation. Um, and it was good to hear your guys' response, so thank you. Also just wanna point out that um, the idea of race is fake. Um, face is how you present to the world. So um, like if you, if you look black, you're black, period. Like if you, look, if you are biracial and you look white, like I don't believe in white passing, you're white. <laughs> white um people like and i know latin america like they have this whole thing like how race is different whatever some of y'all white <laughs> y'all white so yeah i just want to put it out there we gotta be more specific yeah why so oh sorry i was just gonna say it's funny how race is a made-up construct and yet there's still real world consequences to it yeah as an overall arcing response to that um, I would say it's great that you're getting it done from local black businesses. You do have the hair texture for it. I would just say that um, speak out if you have any family members who hold uh, those racist undertones that are common in uh, Tongan and Nicaraguan families. And um, if like you're getting stares in public from black girls, explain to them um, where you got your hair done, how your natural hair is. Um, and just make sure you're like actively putting yourself in that position to fight oppression um, since you are non-Black, but I think that it's okay. Yeah, just to even feed off of Janessa, like I've had some really bad experiences with my Polynesian brothers and sisters back home in Utah when it comes with the N-word. And if you're over here appropriating my culture, I need you to stand up and not say the N-word because that's that there's historical context behind the N-word. We can have a whole conversation just on that. So if there's anti-Blackness happening within your family or in your inner circles and you're appropriating Black person or appreciating it, or you think you are, you need to stand up when that happens. I'm sorry. You can't You can't be one or the other. You can't be for and against. You can't be in the gray area. There is no gray area. You're either with me or you're not. So yeah, that's what I have to say about that. All right, to conclude, we're gonna have our guest speakers drop their Venmos. 
Um, they are doing all of this work pro bono. Um, put your money where your mouth is. If you want to support local Black businesses, local Black people, I always say the best way to do it is just by sending a Black person you know money. Um, we are way overdue for a lot of, we're not even going to go into reparations because we can't even put into money terms what reparations look like because white supremacy is a social system. Um, but yeah, if y'all are looking for ways to support Diva um, and to support this work, please just put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And it's, I'm so happy seeing um, new faces today. We are gonna have be doing this series until November. So please pass this along to your friends. Um, I am so happy to have you all here today. Thank you for being vulnerable with us, sharing some of your stories with us and for asking questions. Um, this was amazing. Uh, Janessa, before we close out, um, cause I've, I've gotten like questions about um, like the whole payment thing, like reparations and stuff. Um, I say it's reparations plus it's not fair that we have to learn your history as a like a core class and have to teach ourselves our own history as well. And then you come to us and get it for free. I think not. Yeah, <laughs> so that's why whenever people ask me questions like to educate them, I'm saying that's cool. You gonna pay me though. <laughs> not fair that I have to do all the extra work and you just get to reap the benefits. I'm not here for it. Our so history is no longer an elective. No. It is no longer an elective at this point. Run us our coins. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. We'll see you next month. <laughs>